700 years into the future, mankind will leave our planet, leaving Earth's cleanup in the hands of one incredible machine. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Life Christian Church. It is so great to be with you today. My name is Christian Smith. I'm one of our online campus pastors, and I'm actually super excited to be at our West Orange campus to deliver a message today. I typically live in London, and my wife, Amanda, and I are the ones who are able to lead the online campus from there. But I have a special week this week as I'm able to close out our At The Movies series. And as you probably know, our lead pastor, Terry Smith, is currently on a study intensive to prepare for the next few months of life at TLCC, and this is after a few months of sabbatical, but he'll be coming back really soon, and I'm so thankful to see all of the work that our team has done here at TLCC and all of our pastors and team members that have stepped up in big ways. Again, I'm super excited to be uh, able to step in today to finish our At The Movie series where we have been looking at famous films and how we can, by putting on uh, a kind of a, a lens of of Christ and scripture see those films to help us understand our life in this world and to be inspired towards the life that God dreams for us. And we've talked about movies like Secretariat and Aladdin and The Greatest Showman and more. And today I have the great pleasure of talking about the movie WALL-E. Now, if you've seen the movie WALL-E, make sure you throw that into the chat and let us know. Throw that into the chat. WALL-E is actually an incredible film, in my opinion. And I just rewatched it recently, preparing to speak on it. I didn't seen it in forever. And I was struck by how incredible it was. And so once I watched it, I was like, goodness gracious, this is like an incredible film. And I, and I, I went on and researched, and there's like a definitive film list from the British Film Institute uh, called the Sight and Sound List. And it's a compilation of, of movie critics and directors and writers who are at the top of their field who vote on what they believe the best films of all time are. And Wally actually is considered one of the top 250 films ever made. It's really incredibly done. And one of the things that really comes through as you're watching it is that it's like essentially uh, a silent film. Now, that may not excite you very much to watch a silent film for who does that excite greatly. But within the film world and the world of film criticism, uh, one, of the, one of the major signs, generally speaking, of a great movie is if you could turn off all the audio, all the sound from the movie and watch it and still know what's going on. Because film is considered primarily a visual medium, and so if you can watch it and, and, and uh, you don't have to use words to explain everything that's happening, and you can tell the movie the story visually, then again, a general principle, that's considered, uh, uh, you've done an effective job of making a movie. Well, Wally, -E, you can pretty much turn off the audio and know what's going on throughout the entire film. In fact, the other day, I was, when I was flying into town to be here this week to be able to preach, you know, it's like a seven and a half hour flight from London. And what I always do is I like go to Netflix or to Amazon Prime or whatever, and I download movies that I can watch on the airplane on my iPad to make sure that I'm like entertained over the course of seven and a half hours. And there was this guy sitting next to me. And I'm like, of course, sitting in this tight little seat in between these two big guys. And Amanda wasn't with me, so she couldn't buffer me from anyone. Difficult life for someone who's 6'4", sitting on an airplane. But there's this guy who I'm like touching elbows with the entire time. 
And after like two hours of sitting on the plane, he was like, he was watching a movie and I, I, I look over and, and he's staring straight at the screen and he has no headphones in. And he literally watched three movies over the course of seven hours with zero audio. And it was like James Bond and Death of the Nile. So they must have been, they must be great movies if he could watch them with no headphones on. It was kind of trippy. I don't know what was going on in that guy's head the entire time. But again, Wally's is a great film, but not just because of the way in which they pull it, pull it off, the way that they use the film medium, but also because of the message that the film tells. And I think it's easy to get your, your, into a certain headspace where you're watching an animated film and you, don't, you automatically don't take it seriously, perhaps, where it feels childish. Well, I think Wally's actually doing something that is, is, is relatively profound within the film space. See, Wally, if you're not familiar with the story, it's the story of a little robot that's named Wally, and he's tasked with cleaning up the earth after humanity had abandoned it to ecological crisis. And humanity had essentially consumed so much of what was on, uh, on the earth and had invested so little in the world that it was void of capacity for biological growth. And so what humanity ended up doing is that once the, once the earth was essentially completely uh, uh, destroyed at its surface level and had no capacity for this biological growth, is they got into a massive like space station, essentially, and launched out into outer space, and they left behind robots who were meant uh, to clean up the earth while the humans were away. Yet... We jump into the story 700 years after the humans go into the space station, and uh, there's only one robot left on the Earth who's functioning and who's able to continue the task of slowly cleaning up the mess that was left. And this robot named Wally is continuing to clean slowly, slowly over the course of 700 years and preparing the Earth for humanity. So he just rolls around this barren earth for all these years, he picks up trash, he's like a mini trash compactor basically, puts it into his robot stomach and then mashes it into a square and he essentially builds up little massive mound, like sky rise uh, uh, size mounds of trash. Now, as we think about the themes and meaning in this movie, I'd say that one that obviously comes to mind for us is ecological crisis. And there's a lot that we could say about the Christian vocation to care for the earth, but oftentimes we know that this issue can be very politicized. Uh, it can be a hot topic where you have people who have uh, uh, you know, strong feelings on either side of what one should or shouldn't do. Again, it's worth noting the, the vocation and role that, that humanity does have in caring for the earth, uh, though this won't be my primary emphasis in my message today. But again, we should note that from Genesis 1, we see uh, the, the, the initial proclamation of God that his creation is good, that he loves creation. And we see again in the New Testament that God so loved the world that he sent his only son to save it. See, humanity has a vocation for leading and caring for and having a responsibility for the world at large. We are God's representative as image bearers who are to reflect God's love into the world. We are the pinnacle as humanity, as image bearers of God's creative activity, and we have a job in leading to the world into the dreams that God has for it. We are empowered by God to accomplish this sort of task. And there's no other created thing in the world that has the capacity to do the kinds of things that we do. Lions can't lead the world and insects can't lead the world into the way that it's supposed to exist. And also, despite what we might think today, artificial intelligence and robots, it's not their job to lead the world where it's supposed to go either because we're the ones who program that stuff. So in a sense, we receive the leadership from God and have this responsibility to lead the world into its God-inspired destiny. The thing is, is that we can easily forget our vocation to care for creation. And again, I'm, as I'm talking about uh, uh, these themes in Wally of caring for, uh, caring for the earth, uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, more so as representative of our broader human uh, uh, goal and mission to promote love and hope and peace.
peace and caring for our brothers and sisters in beauty, that we have that vocation uh, that God has given us to make the world more like those things, those things that God desires. But we can easily forget this vocation. So we all know that there is much to do in the world, but sometimes I think that we can be lulled into uh, forgetting that that's actually our responsibility or that we are supposed to do something about the broken things in the world. So many times I've heard people say, and I'm sure that you have in some instances heard people say, you know, something like, you know, well, God saved me and God is going to come back at some point and he's going to make everything right. Yes, we can't deny it. There are a lot of broken things in the world, but ultimately, if anyone's going to make it right, God's going to make it right. If God wants it to be fixed, then he'll fix it. There's nothing that I can do about it. And this is really a a consciously passive approach that views human agency and, and our role as one that is, that is merely receptive of the work of God, that it's God's sovereignty uh, to do things, to make things right, and that we have no participation in God's plan to make the world right. And I think what, what ends up happening is that we can, you know, kind of put our head in the sand, wait for God to do something, and to forget that we are actually supposed to do something. And it is as if we like the Wally characters, we kind of send ourselves off in a spaceship, we bar ourselves up in rooms, and forget that we're actually supposed to be out here doing something, working with God. See, we are God's agents of change who stay present in the midst of brokenness. We are to stay in the world, fulfilling our vocation. We are not supposed to leave it and wait for it to be made right by someone else. See, God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. His spirit was sent into us while we are in the world so we can work out the love of God into the rest of the world. I love this verse in John 17, which is Jesus as he's praying to the Father. He says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that, you, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word. He's talking about Uh, people uh, within the world, and the world has hated them. The world has hated the words of Jesus, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world." So often we think about what God is doing in the world, what our relationship is with God, and again, we have the sense of we are saved, and that means we're going to get to go away and escape the brokenness. But what Jesus is specifically saying here is, no, I have entered into the world, and yes, things are broken, and we don't want to be a part of it, and it's, it's gross, and it's messed up in a lot of ways, but ultimately, we fundamentally have a relationship of love towards the world and to, the, to all the creation that God has existed And we, therefore, are not supposed to sit with an escape route mentality in our minds. We are supposed to presence within the brokenness. God wants you to invest your life and your work and your gifts into his creation, again, holistically his creation, into people and places and things. God wants you to use the gifts that he has given you so that you can stay present amidst the dissonance and try and make things right with God. God. Now, maybe you have a lot of difficult things going on in your life in difficult situations that you're practically a part of. That could be relationships, that could be work contexts, whatever it might be. And sometimes we do need to get out of difficult situations. So, uh, you know, we want to be nuanced here. But I want to encourage you to see, uh, to, to consider what it would be like when you see a broken circumstance around you or in your life what it would feel like, what it would be like, what you could do of instead of thinking of escape, of what it would mean to sit down in those places, to establish your presence in those difficult moments of life and see if God can specially use you through his spirit to make something right in difficult, broken circumstances. I think that this is, though, really difficult to do in our day and age, and that we sometimes, again, have tendencies to abdicate the vocation that God has given us, and we can be tremendously distracted from our vocation, this role that God has given us to be present in the difficulties of the world. 
Now, continuing with uh, Wally, we start to see what has led humanity to abdicate their vocation in leading creation. See, while Wally, uh, while he's minding his business and he's doing his work, he sees this small spaceship that comes down to Earth and another robot comes out of it. And you get the sense that this is like the first other robot moving thing that he has seen in a very long time. And it's actually a female robot in as much as a robot can be female, but it appears such, and her name is Eve, and Wally begins to kind of like take a fancy uh, uh, to her. So Eve, as we find out, is automatically sent to the Earth from the big space station all the humans are in, and, the hum- and, and her goal is to go there and to try and find plant life, to see if the world is becoming habit- habitable so that humans can come back and inhabit the Earth. Well, Eve ends up finding a small plant that Wally had found while he was collecting trash, and essentially her programming automatically sees the plant, and she shuts down, she takes the plant, she puts it inside of her robot stomach, and then what ends up happening is a, 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 a spaceship comes back down to collect her and bring that plant back to the massive space station so that humans can be alerted to the fact that the earth can potentially be re-inhabited. But because Wally has this growing affection for Eve, he stows away on the spaceship and returns to the humans with her, where we learn a lot more about what's going on with humanity and what has led to their abandonment of the earth so we can see what's going on within the space station. And so Wally is staying with Eve once they get into the space station because he's worried about her because she's shut off. She's like, you know, unconscious. And he's tracking around with her and trying to stay with her as the robots are transporting her through this space station. And what we see is a bunch of humans who live in the station who are essentially plopped into chairs that are stuck on automatic tracks that drive them wherever they want to go. And they have screens that are placed in front of their faces. And they've to put it lightly, grown quite considerably because they've moved around very little since their birth. Even the babies are in little chairs and they get driven around. Their bone density has shrunk because of the nature of gravity or something like that. And all their interactions with other people only come through the screen. So you have scenes where like, you have two guys who are on tracks uh, 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 moving forward next to one another and they're talking though through the screens that are in front of their face. And they're talking about playing virtual sports and going and playing virtual golf. And this entire space station and everything within it is run by this corporation called Big and Large, which continually feeds them entertainment and these basic pleasures that will satiate them until they are supposedly supposed to go back to Earth. Now, obviously, the writers of this film know what they're doing. They are hyperbolically trying to represent our culture or to represent where our culture is going. And I I do think it's quite an effective indictment. Yes, we're on our phones a lot. Yes, we uh, like to do virtual things often more than things in real life. We're we're less physically active. Uh, We often engage with people in, in, in virtual ways or over phones more often than we do in reality. And we all spend a lot of time consuming things and buying things. How many Amazon packages do you receive a week? It's a question I have for my wife frequently when all the Amazon packages come to the door and I'm unaware. We spend a lot of time doing stuff like this, living virtually, buying things. But why is this? I I think we can have a super surface level critique of culture and be like, you know, like the, the guy who's on his, you know, the front lawn, like, get off my lawn to little kids. And similarly, be like, get off your phone, as if phones are inherently bad. Or, I, But I feel like those are surface critiques of culture. There are reasons why we have ended up this way. Because distraction, um, distractions like cell phones or television or consumption, is, is not new to where we are in, in, in history. This isn't a, a 21st century issue or a 20th century issue. Drink and drug have existed for all of time. And in all cultures, people have wanted to engage in pleasures that distract them from the realities of the world. 
So what is it that's unique about, about our contemporary culture um, that has led us to, to have this uh, 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 really kind of unique moment in time where we have things like devices stuck in our faces for uh, a, a lot of the day? And what about our culture may perpetuate this issue over time? Well, Deeper down, what I think a more fundamental issue is that's going on here, and again, that relates to kind of the story that we're discussing in Wally, is that our, our cultural narrative today is if you're happy, then you're right. If you're happy, then, you're, then you're, you're, you're in the good. You're living the life that you should live. We feel um, in, in, intuitively that how we live our modern lives is off somehow, like, you know, I'm on my cell phone too much, or I watch too much TV, or I buy too much, or I buy too many clothes, right? We all, we, all, we all know that those are things that we say about our lives, but it feels too good to do something different. We know something's off, but it feels too good to, whenever you're doing something, instead of having to, you know, engage with the world or other people to go on your cell phone. And so, one, it feels good to do these kinds of things, so we don't stop doing them. And then, two, our culture tells us that uh, it, it validates us in saying, yeah, but if that thing makes you happy, then keep doing that thing. No matter how you're living, unless you're like physically harming other people or doing something wildly against social norms, uh, then people will not try and correct you because it makes you feel good. Now, a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, there was, uh, I was uh, uh, looking at this video the other day, hearing the story about this guy who lives in the multiverse, which is a virtual universe. Check out this video. You're gonna love this. This man lives full time in the metaverse. In his daily routine, he would wake up and go to the bathroom, take a shower, and even commute to work. He claims that he spends 24 seven in the metaverse because it's a better living environment. After work, he gets into his metaverse bed and watches movies on his large virtual flat screen TV. What do you think about this? Follow for more things you can do in the metaverse. So this guy has been living in a fake universe, essentially, because it makes him happier than being in the real world. Now, what a lot of times our society would say is, well, if that thing makes you happy and you're struggling in the real world, then go for it. Go enjoy a fake universe, uh, a, a, a fake reality. Now, I don't know what's happening entirely in the gentleman's life, and so I don't want to make like, a, a direct judgment of that. However, I would generally say, and I think many of you would agree, that that's probably not a proper way to live. I was just having conversation with some friends recently, actually, who brought up, you know, like, if you were living in the matrix, like, you have stuff that's being pumped into your brain and is making you have uh, like false experiences of reality. If you guys have seen uh, the movie, The Matrix, would you want to get out of the fake reality, which is essentially the same thing as the virtual reality and the guy? In both instances, you're experiencing something that is fake. Uh, are those things, would you want to stay in those fake realities if those made you happier than what reality is in and of itself? And because we, however, worship a God of truth, I think that we automa automatically have to say, no, living in that sort of fake reality, or like with Wally, having the screen in front of your face, and you're, and you're just basically living through a screen, living through virtual experience, and not living kind of the fullness of human life that God has for us, we have to say, no, we do not want to live in these kinds of ways, because we worship a God of truth. Jesus is, is truth incarnate in the flesh. Therefore, we want what is more real, what is more good than what the world is telling us is good for us. And what's good for you is whatever you like. And we immediately have to stop the conversation and I think uh, constantly critique our desires and have a little bit of self-doubt and come to God and ask him, God, am how I living my life? Are my desires what you desire for me? Just because I like it, just because it feels good to me, just because it's self-satisfying, God, but is this, is this satisfying? Is it satisfying the depth of my being? Am I living the way that you designed me to live within reality? So many times, society is saying, consume this, do this. It's going to make you happier. Sit in this chair, let it pull you along a track of a consistent kind of lineup of satisfaction of things from the world that keep you distracted instead of putting your eyes actually onto Jesus and asking Jesus, what track do you have for me? We have to have a healthy dose of self-doubt and to say, God, is this thing good? 
is this lifestyle good for me? And ask him, God, do you want this for me? See, sometimes we abdicate our vocation because our vocation isn't, isn't just about us. And the world tells us that everything is about us and what we want. We have to put our eyes back on Jesus and ask him how he might be asking us to self-sacrifice by being a part of the broken world and not to continually be fulfilled by finite, broken things that self-satisfy. Now, another major reason why I think we get distracted from our vocation and what this film has to tell us is that we use distractions to escape or blind ourselves from a difficult world. But why do we spend so much time on our phones or why do we spend so much time consuming things or buying things? Well, I think a big part of it is simply to distract ourselves, that we want to turn our minds off from the difficult things in life. We buy things in order to experience a temporary fulfillment, oftentimes to distract us from our lack of true, deep satisfaction that God has destined for us. I mean, people who have Netflix accounts watch an average of three days, uh, three hours of Netflix a day, or people spend an average uh, of over four hours on their cell phones a day. And I'm, I sometimes engage in these sort of habits. So I'm grouping myself in these kinds of, uh, this, this, this kind of situation as well. This kind of indictment sometimes for us. I think that we're simply distracting ourselves into oblivion. Sometimes because it just feels good. And sometimes because we're selfish with our time and attention. And also just to distract ourselves from the brokenness all around us. We're distracting ourselves from the work that we're supposed to do and from the failure that we have, uh, that we have engaged in by not uh, being a part of the vocation that God has given us. When we pull up our cell phone in front of our face sometimes, or when we turn on the TV, we're effectively putting our head in the sand so that we don't have to look at what's going on in the world. And this reminds me of a verse from Haggai, uh, where the, uh, the, the Jewish people uh, who are a part of, of uh, God's nation essentially have uh, given up their vocation of caring for the house of God. And this is what we read from the prophet Haggai. Then the word, word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? The people of Israel, their houses were great, but the house of God was in ruin. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you've harvested little. You've had little return on your investments. You eat, but never have enough. Gluttony. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. See, what's happening here is people are tending so much to their own home that they're letting the, the house of God go to ruin. They're distracting themselves with drink and with food and with clothing, but none of them are actually satisfying because these are false senses of self-satisfaction. They are empty promises of fulfillment in the world. Now, distractions aren't always bad. Right? Sometimes it's good for us to be able to unplug and enjoy something and enjoy God's good creation. But sometimes we can be so distracted that we miss the entire world, world around us. We can put these digital materialistic blinders over our eyes so that we don't see the world that God so loved and what needs to happen within it. And the cherry on top of all of this, I think, is that I, I don't just think it's, it's accidental that this is how we can often live as humanity, or it's not just merely uh, our misguided sinful selves that cause this to happen. There is, I believe, what we see in Scripture, an intentional plan behind us being distracted, behind us having this innate desire and temptation to escape from the world. And we'll see, for example, uh, this, this, this sense of this intentionality behind this, this escapist uh, plan and these distractions taking place. So in Wally, what ends up happening, when Eve is prepared to give the plant over to the captain, it's actually missing. Someone had taken it from her. And the captain then gives up on the plan, and he's satisfied with this idea of just staying on the station. But Eve and Wally are persistent, and they're determined in finding the plant so that they could accomplish their mission to bring humanity back to Earth. Well, in the meantime, the captain of the ship has his interest peaked in earth and what it might be like. 
And so he starts doing some Googling and he realizes that the earth seems pretty cool. He realizes that there's pizza on earth, that there's dancing on earth, that you can grow these beautiful things on earth. And he ends up also wanting to go back. Luckily, Wally and Eve, they end up finding the plant on the ship and they try and bring it back to the captain, but realize that the entire time that the artificial intelligence system that controls the space station is in an an autopilot mode that is determined to distract humanity to the extent that they never want to go back to Earth. And so they begin fighting the, this, like, this robot system is fighting against the captain and Eve and Wally, trying to make sure that the plant is destroyed and that humanity never goes back to Earth, that they continue to stay in this false reality in this space station, living lesser lives. You see, the whole time, it wasn't just humanity making bad decisions that kept them distracted and had this materialistic, consumeristic lens on. There was an intentional plan with the artificial intelligence that was keeping humans away from the world. It wasn't just humanity's fault, though they fully bear their own burden for failing in their vocation to take care of the world. There was also this external force that was working and plotting and planning the entire time, taking advantage of their weaknesses to plunge them into this escapist consumerism and keep the blinders on to not see what was broken about the world. I think this is fairly similar in an odd way to the story of Christianity where, yes, we can naturally get caught uh, uh, by our own sin into doing things that we are not supposed to do, into doing things like abdicating our vocation and the plan that God has for our lives. But we also have to remember that there are systems and powers, there are evil authorities behind behind the scenes in spiritual realms that are actively attempting us to not engage with the mission that God has given us. We see in Ephesians 6.12, as Paul is, is writing to the Christian church, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are evil realities that are working in the world that are fighting against this, though we may not see them, they are present and operating in ways that we might not expect. And one of evil's main uh, tools in its tool belt is to distract us from God. And one of the major ways that evil can impact us is by embedding us in the systems of life that look very normal and look very human and look like creation, but in fact, they might be inspired and influenced by evil realities. See, sometimes when we think about spiritual evil existing within the world, we think of something like, uh, you know, th- thinking of movies like The Exorcist or something crazy like that. We think of like demonic possession or something that's super dramatic and obvious and, and really gross and evil. Well, in reality, uh, how, with how some people would put it, is that evil doesn't want you to know that it is evil. Evil wants to present itself as good. And so evil can try to embed itself in normalized life and slowly lead us astray so that we do not realize that we are going astray. Evil doesn't want us to realize that we are rejecting God. It wants us to simply, uh, in some instances, just to not think about God anymore. Evil wants us to be so distracted from the life that God has given us in this world so that we escape the world so that evil can then take over the world. And if we leave, if we leave our post here on earth as God's agents for leading the world, then someone, something will take our place here. And what evil wants is to have control and to have power over things. And wants us to leave so that it has room to fill the earth with its presence. Now, There are all sorts of ways I think that we all know that evil can embed itself in society and the world. We can see this in systems and ways that the world works. But I want to encourage you to be hyper-conscious of this in your life. What might be uh, things that you're watching or things that you're looking at that might not be from God, that might not be good? It might feel good, again, when you're experiencing it, but you might realize that, you know what, maybe... uh, 
the evil powers do want me to engage in this activity over and over again for lots of time so that I'm distracted from what's happening and what God has for me in my life. Don't just take the natural offerings that the world has for you, but question them and realize that all the time evil is lurking behind the corner, trying to catch us and to help us be tempted into messing up and joining us in sin. And I think that this series is actually really appropriate for this kind of point, because media has such a unique capacity. Film has such a unique capacity. Social media has such a unique capacity to lead us into sin, to lead us into temptation in certain kinds of ways. Yes, it can distract us. It can sap up our time, but it can also turn our thoughts to think in ways that are not godly ways of thinking. There have been intentional propagandistic movements uh, 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 through groups of people who have tried to work into media to to, to build uh, negative sentiments towards Christian thought and value. There have been movements that have actively tried to tear down the people of God within media. They're like well-known initiatives that have happened through history. And if we do not have our eyes open, if we do not have our ears open to be attuned to the potentiality for evil systems and powers lurking behind the scenes in the world, then we might get lulled into falling into the thought patterns that are so compellingly communicated to us in creative ways through things like the media and the world, through things like ads that we see and billboards that we see. We'll start to think that we do need X car to be fulfilled. We will start to think that I have to be or act like that person. We will start to think that this is how one's uh, 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 private life should should, should play itself out. Maybe in ways like how how we see uh, uh, sexuality portrayed uh, within film and television and social media. And all of a sudden, our minds start to walk down this path and go, this is how I'm supposed to live. This is what's going to be satisfying for me. That's exactly what the evil systems and powers want. But we have to live with eyes open and to realize that God wants us to keep our minds, our eyes, our thoughts stuck onto the good things of God. As Robert K. Johnson, a Christian scholar in theology and film, he says, film has become our Western culture's major storytelling and myth-producing medium. All of us live within stories. Our lives are lived within a story of the Western American world for those of us who have spent most of our time here. And if we begin to, 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 to live in the stories and the myths that culture is telling us, then we may be led astray in working towards the end of the wrong story. There's this part in, in Wally, as I close out here, where uh, the, the captain finally receives the operation manual uh, that is supposed to help him get back to Earth. But he had essentially become so illiterate that he, he receives uh, the book and, and, and he's trying to read the front of it, which is operation manual. And he says, operate manual. He had become so illiterate to the plan to get back to earth, the whole purpose of him being there, that when he saw the plan in front of him, he couldn't even read it. It was so foreign to him. And so what I want to encourage us in today is, is maybe uh, we've spent so much time on the wrong track and distracted by what the world has to offer us that we've become so illiterate to realizing what, the, what God's plan is for us. We have to relearn sometimes to think how God thinks. We have to pick up scripture, for instance, and to spend time in it so that we can remember what the plan and the story of God is. We have to get undistracted. We have to get our minds back on the right path. We have to get off of the autopilot track that culture often wants us to live on, that sometimes evil systems and powers can operate in, to lead us down to the wrong end so that we escape the world and we don't actually sit in the vocation that God has given us. All of us have to turn off the autopilot that culture wants to lead us on, to hand us off from ad to phone to television to purchasing this and purchasing that and to stop and to step off of the track and say, God, what do you have for me today? How do you want to to, to help me to have hope in you and your plan? How do you want me to engage your world? What desires do you have for, for me today? Is it different from what I might be desiring right now? Is it different from what the world might be desiring for me right now? Let me take the screen, the VR headset, the materialistic lens, all those things, and put my eyes on you and ask you to guide me. Ultimately, God has an incredible purpose and plan for your 
life. And Wally ends up ending up, you know, a beautiful ending to the story, and they all end up getting back to earth through fighting the evil powers. And it's really an inspiring story, reminding us that we have to continue to persist in our vocations. Well, we can remember as Christians, we look at a film like this and we say, okay, what's the Christian lens with this? Is we can remember that, yes, sometimes there's evil, broken things that's messing stuff up. Sometimes I'm a part of that evil. Sometimes I'm a part of that brokenness, a lot of the time. But God, you have something more for me. I don't have to be stuck in this life. God, you have something more for me. Please reveal yourself to me. Help me to re-see your plan both for the world and my life and how I can fit into it. When you do that, I promise you that might be difficult, but you will be inspired and encouraged to more life than you've ever dreamed of. Thank you guys so much. 